I don't understand uh, this, but I'm actually looking into the world of why philanthropy is at the mercy of capitalism these days in the world. And why can't we just, I mean, if I were to die tomorrow, I want to leave this world a better place, right? What we're trying to do really is earth restoration for uh, the future of humanity, right? Even if we need to explore other planets, we're gonna have to restore earth's resources and sustain them. This is Cookie, and I don't know if uh, he'll let he'll stay for long. Oh wow, but... he's not a normal cat, huh? Or is that yeah? A normal he cat? well, he's got Ooh. this extra. Uh, yeah. It's like it's like catcher's mitt, oven mitt, you know. <laughs> Where'd you find him? Well, he's um, he's uh, uh, you know uh, a street cat. Oh really? So we, okay. we adopted him from the street. Okay, so how did you get interested in cats? Because and you were interested in big cats, right? Yeah, I was interested in, um, well, I was interested in big cats in general. Like, obviously, you grew grew up in India, you learn so much about tigers and, you know, lions and all the mythological. Yeah. Lemurs and all sorts of other things, right? (laughs) Right, right. Um, But, you know, the craziness didn't set in uh, up until I finished my engineering degree because, you know, that's what we do in India. We first get our engineering degree and then we do everything else. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So how did the engineering degree take you to, you know, cat conservation? Well, um, you know, it was a degree in biotechnology. And then after that, I was... uh, Finishing it up, and then at the end of right in this last year, um, I was always interested in wildlife, and you know I would get outdoors with my dad. You know, would go hiking into the country. And um, did you ever see a tiger out there? No. Yeah, we went to a lot of national parks, but uh, you know, seeing a tiger is not that easy. Seeing wildcats in general is not that easy. So um, anyway, I was I was this outdoorsy kind of person. You know, getting Mm -hmm. outdoor with my dad, and then. Uh, my mom was in the Serengeti. Well, actually, my mom was in Tanzania. She's a doctor. She's a gynecologist. And she was practicing in Tanzania. And we got hosted by my mom in Tanzania on an international, our first international trip. So we went to the Serengeti okay. uh, right in the final year of my engineering degree. And then I was in the Serengeti with uh, camping out for the first time in my life with my dad. And of course, my mom funded our trip. She didn't come on that trip. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, that just sold me because I was uh, the best part is I was camping out with those field guides and their names were Thomas and Jerry. <laughs> and, and, and it was magical because uh, Tom and Jerry, you know, they're like so inspiring. They right. knew everything about the lions. They knew everything about the leopards right. and all the amazing, you know, species out there in, in the Serengeti. Now, did you did you see any of those cats? Absolutely. That was a safari that sold me into wildlife conservation, and I had to do something about it. So, uh, fast forward uh, ten years, I got my PhD in wildlife conservation, and now there's no even- mangroves. Wait, wait, Jesse, let him talk. You're co- wait. What did you say? I <laughs> yeah, yeah, mangroves is coming through. Uh, got well, your PhD. I, uh, I finished my PhD in wildlife conservation and uh, changed the license plate on my car to cat DNA. Okay. <laughs> we missed that. We would have missed that. Okay. Okay. Cat DNA. Now, so where, were said, you I mean, living? where were you living then? Um, well, after India moved here to Tucson, I mean, actually, I, I, I went to a conference in, in uh, Oxford at the UK after I finished... Uh, I came back from the Serengeti, finished my engineering degree, and then I found a person working on tigers in India uh, at this research lab. And I got, I mean, I was fascinated with cats and wildlife, so I wanted to get into wildlife research. So right. um, I started working. You know, it's, it's the funny part is the first thing you, if you're a wildlifer, when you start uh, studying wildlife, the first thing you're handed is a bunch of poop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it's all up it's from a, there, you know what I mean? I, I saw, I, I analyzed tiger poop to start with. And, and what you know, did you find out about it? What was in there? Uh, 
a lot of crazy stuff. So we were, we were first of all, using genetics to identify whether it was a tiger or another species. Right. Uh, and then the same thing, even in, uh, you know, when I started my master's here in uh, Arizona, it was mountain lions and bobcats. who so we were trying to differentiate between the two and then and find out what they- hard to do because there's not a taxonomy necessarily that that's easily understood. So are you the first person doing that or is there already something to look at there, there's a lot of research out there i mean it's it's extensively worked on uh you know you can you can find out from scat you know a, it's a gold mine of information you can tell who's who's daddy who's related to whom mm-hmm. uh what species it is uh yeah. where you know which population is it from around the area uh, in it's fact, like there, when there aliens one time, scan us and, and they look around, they know all that stuff that we don't even know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there was, there was a funny incident when I was uh, uh, analyzing mountain lion poop, a lady handed me uh, 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 a Ziploc baggie of, of poop that she thought was mountain lion and then a, with it, a bag of cookies. And she said, please <laughs> let me know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ow. Wait, and then I got... <laughs> So I got the nickname Scatman. Is there coffee? Hi. Some poop. Somebody's poop. There's coffee they make somewhere. That's a whole other story. But we don't. We're yeah, not, that's right? a you know great. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna avoid all that. Oh, we can avoid that. But anyway, so Kopi Luwak, yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, but so, you, but be, the love of the cat, though, like the love of the cat, like. But but those are big cats. Those yeah. are giant cats. How do you go from these big giant cats to these little itty big cats? You know, um, and tell us about the place where you tell the same kind of the mangroves and being out there. And did you ever see a cat out there? And what do these cats look like? That came out later. So, uh, you you know, like you, you, you deal with the big stuff and then you realize, oh, I really need to pay attention to the underdogs. You know, the things that don't Mm. get as much attention. You you know that feeling, right? Right. Yeah, I do it all the time with Jesse. Right. We have a whole company based on that exactly you know you know the big companies are the big companies and then there's the small companies and then you want to do something with a startup and things like that right yes. so anyway uh with i studied tigers and i studied mountain lions and i studied uh all uh you know i was in the big cat world and i found out that there was there were 30 uh eight species of cat wild cats at that time i think they're more like 40 right now that have been described mm-hmm. uh, um wild cats yeah and people have rarely heard of these names but you know i'll rattle off a few um uh, andean cat pampas cat palace cat black-footed cat bay cat fishing cat rusty spotted cat rusty spotted cat is the world's smallest cat mm-hmm. it's like it's about the size of a wine bottle right. and it lives in South Asia. So everyone knows tigers, leopards, lions, you know, all the snow leopards, all the, you know, big, beautiful um, cats. So, but then very, very little research was published on these smaller cats. And I wanted to see how we could take all the great, amazing knowledge and talent and ideas that we have. And, uh, you know, that we've studied all these big cats with and then apply them to these smaller cats so that's when um i said okay well there's what's the next most endangered cat next to the tiger and where am i from you know i speak four indian languages uh why can't i you know and i kept going back and forth between india and the u.s um Mm -hmm. the last you know decade while i was doing my studies to try to do conservation work and i found out that uh fishing cats uh live um in my backyard, pretty much. I mean, from the state I am from. And um, there were many areas where they were there and nobody seemed to care about them. And the uh, fact that, you know, they were endangered um, and their habitat is being lost like many other wildlife species. You know, the biggest threat to wildlife is habitat loss. Um, So did you, so did you, hear about that and then how far away from your home is it is it a two hours by car is it three hours by car you did to take a plane flight like the first time you went to see what it was like how far was the journey it was about a day's worth of driving and then walking into uh so about eight to nine hours of driving and then um into the villages uh from the city 
And then you go into these mangrove forests, which, you know, we were looking at these locations uh, via Google satellite imagery. And we yeah. thought, you know, these were the most likely places that these cats might be because they are wetland adapted. Uh, they love to fish. Um, and so... No, are you looking for scat when you first get there? Or you... Yeah, tracks and scat, precisely, you know, just like, uh, it's kind of cool. I wish I had cat tracks, but... Um, you know, if you look at to if you look at cat tracks, they're mm -hmm. kind of cool. You can tell between left and right. They're the toes of the cats are just like our fingernails, mm -hmm. and you can tell between left and right looking at that. But um, yeah, we were looking for tracks because that's what you look for on moist sand. And the best part about fishing cats is those tracks are perfect. You know, it's hard to uh, find cat tracks uh, like mountain lions mm -hmm. and. Uh, tigers because you know they're in these drier environments also and uh, the, the substrate isn't the best but with fishing cats they're in these wetlands and this loamy soil just makes this perfect textbook style cat print so did um, you go by yourself initially or did you go with somebody well i sent my dad <laughs> hey, wait, wait, i'm confused though were you in arizona and then you went back home to do yeah, yeah 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 absolutely okay. i mean so yeah, to seal up the story, uh, you know, after Serengeti, when I came back, I didn't want to do engineering anymore. I wanted to get mm -hmm. into wildlife. And so I, I uh, got in touch with this lady who was studying tigers um, in, in India. And then she hooked me up with a project in tigers. And then I presented the results of that research, basically tiger poop analysis, finding out that there's actually tigers in an area where people thought there were, mm -hmm. you know, tigers are going extinct. And, and lo and behold, in Oxford, when I presented that research, I met my advisor, uh, who was that he's, she's a mountain lion legend. Her name is Melanie. Uh, she's not Culver. actually a I thought, mountain I thought lion. She was, I she's thought you were, that's what I thought you were going to say. Person, she or, was a mountain a lion. She's a person who studies mountain lions, right? <laughs> yeah. So she, she did this pioneering genetic research on finding out, uh, uh, you know, basically letting people know that the Florida panther is uh, the same as your puma or mm -hmm. cougar. Mm -hmm. You know, mountain lions have so many names, Puba, Cougar, uh, you know, Catamount, uh, Mount, you know, many places, the Panther, Painter, yeah. and some, 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 some places. But anyway, she did a lot of research and I was this, you know, budding graduate student or uh, looking to get into now, grad had school. She, had she done research on the fishing cat? No, she had not. She was uh, more into genetics and genomics of, uh, I mean, she was into human genomics and genetics. And then mm -hmm. she uh, started doing this uh, mountain lion uh, genetics um, uh, work. And she was, she became well known for that. I met her at that conference and this was mm -hmm. a unique conference. There's never been such a conference in the world. Mm -hmm. Again, it was only one time, 300 wild cat specialists flew in from all over the world into this location in Oxford in, uh, in September oh, of 2006. Was the liquor flowing or what? It was crazy, yeah. <laughs> Everyone was... There's a, there's a reason it only Cat happened I once. Think we need to, that's a good idea. We should start a liquor called Catatonic. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Brand it right now, right yeah. now. I was um, going to ask if everybody was purring, but that was, you know, I guess that was... What was yeah, happening. well, so, we tried drinking like a... a fish or whatever for yeah. fishing cats but anyway yeah. yeah the cat get the cats uh specialist you know that's where i uh presented my research and um my advisor was like wow you know you did this great stuff on tigers you know i'd love to give you an opportunity to come to a master's program you know obviously i was like super enthusiastic i really wanted to get into an official wildlife program mm -hmm. and when i got here the first thing i get handed by her is a box of poop <laughs> That yeah. that was my master's degree analyzing yeah. mountain lion poop. So it was fun. It was awesome. No, I, I could. No. And then I, I practiced my fake accent. Right, the first talk that I gave in the U.S. It's like I'm staying right here, in America, where I can get a bucket of chicken for a buck <laughs> ninety five. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Did it work? I don't know. I, I don't know if it's still working. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so okay. So you send your dad to the. To the th first off, how did the conversation with your dad when you said, I don't want to be an engineer anymore, I want to study swimming cats? What, how did that conversation go? <sighs> he was like, I'm waiting for the time in your life where he's like, I told you, I told you, you know, he wanted, he wanted to get, 
that, that's what he keeps saying. I'm, uh, I want to get to the point where, you know, you really fall flat on your face and you're like, I told you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, okay, but he, somehow, he, but but somehow, he, you convinced him to go to the village without you, yeah? Yeah, I mean, he's a he's kind of a maverick in our family. He was the one who who used to get out uh, get outdoors, and uh, you know, in India, like recreation wasn't really a thing when I grew up, and uh, getting outdoors and going on hikes and stuff and climbing rocks mm -hmm. uh, in unknown places was kind of a weird thing. But he got me into that so he was he had no problem getting outdoors and he, he thought this was just exciting uh and now, so are you a city kid in india would you did you live in the city nah i i grew up in the city but i was always uh you know i wanted to get outdoors and do stuff but so you, did, you didn't you didn't you drove for nine hours but you never had any feeling of danger from going to a village or do is that is that something that you'd have like here in America, I would feel nervous about doing that. Is it less so there? Not really. Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's the kind of people you're talking to. Some people are just super city focused and some people are just like, you know, super, uh, you know, non-city. But generally, I found, so I've traveled in many places. I, in fact, I traveled with my dad to Indonesia, to uh, um, other countries in South and Southeast Asia as well. We keep traveling, we keep meeting for these field opportunities mm. these days because we want to discover these cats and we want to work with the people who are working next to these cats. Yeah, that's uh, just like a dad. Now he's interested in what you're interested. Now he's interested. Now he's hooked, right? Let's go back <laughs> to the fishing cat though. So this was, a, this. you heard about the fishing cat. You sent your dad. And by the way, it's a fishing cat. Like, what does that mean? The cat is actually going fishing? It's called a fishing cat because uh, I guess because well, its scientific name is Prionellurus viverinus. So it's they're, they're named after viverids, uh, which are actually uh, kind of like mustelids. Uh, but uh, you know, when people studied this cat, they found that the cat likes water uh, or lives next to you know these wetlands and loves to catch fish. So if you look at a photo of a fishing cat, you know you'll see. Uh, most of them are in water and wetlands. And the, the photos that we obtained too, you know, most of the times we found them uh, looking for fish. And, you know, it's an app name. I think it's awesome. Cats usually hate water and this freaking cat loves water, right? So no, uh, he'll, they'll use one paw. They'll tap the paw on the top of the water because it sounds like a fish. That's, you know, that's what I've heard, but I haven't seen that. And neither is there any video documentation of that happening in the wild. Uh, but yeah, that's really cool cool to uh, i mean it, it, for for us i think um i think you know we don't i haven't seen any evidence of it is what i'm trying to say but it i think it, i think that's what they do they also just jump in uh to catch fish mm -hmm. and you know if you go to zoos i don't know where you guys you're in la right yeah, yeah. Uh, San Francisco Zoo has fishing cats. Oh, San Diego Zoo has fishing cats. Um, and you can go see them uh, jump into water and catch fish. What's your feeling about zoos? Well, zoos are, the whole point is conservation, right? The idea is to protect and restore wild animals. And if a zoo is able to do that effectively, then I'm okay with it. But if a zoo is just a zoo for a business perspective to capitalize on animals, um, then I don't think that's, that's the way to go going forward. It's not going to be sustainable anyway. Right. Uh, even, I mean, from a business standpoint, uh, when we started Fishing Cat Conservancy in 2014, it was all about looking, discovering this cat and trying to protect it. Mm -hmm. But you know, why, why do, why is this cat endangered? Why is this habitat being lost? And it's all because of business reasons. When you look at what people are being incentivized by, mm -hmm. you know, deforestation, climate change, extinction, all of this is happening because there are no jobs that are, uh, you know, solving these problems. There are no jobs that are making pe people plant trees, you know, that, that it's not a valued field and that's what i learned when i graduated it's like i mean my my friends who are in wildlife they left wildlife they're like dude there's no money in wildlife i'm getting out, I'm, I'm getting out of here but, what, but and i'm like that's really sad we got to change that right and so that's mm -hmm. when we started discovering that you know this is an ecological problem but it needs to go hand in hand with e 
econo- economy, you know, local right. economy. And we need to build in an economic solution to this ecological problem. If we don't create jobs in conservation, uh, we we're not going to basically succeed at protecting these species and their habitat. And that's the reason why uh, I was motivated to start Fishing Cat Conservancy. And that's, that's why I started Fish Cat. It's creating jobs for conservation. So when do you see, so you start by seeing scat now, you know, and tracks. Now, do you, because you can infer what the cat's doing a bit from these, these uh, tracks and you can, you know, you can see what other animals are doing and where they are in an ecosystem and how many there might be there. Like, what did you learn when you first went and saw that? And were you surprised that you saw tracks and scat right away? Yes, I was actually, I mean, we are, our estimation that this cat is going to be in these habitats and that nobody had gone and discovered them. We were studying this cat on in paper and there were only like 15 or 16 research papers published on it and its behavior. But we, you know, with that in preliminary information, we're like, boom, these are the locations that they might be in. Let's go check them out. And then we went there, boom, we saw tracks. We put up wildlife cameras, which are these, you know, game cameras where motion sensor cameras where animal moves in front of them, you get a picture. And we we're like, yep, put it on this cat. You got a fishing cat. Now, did and you did you stay there or did you set the camera and then come back yeah. a week later? Yeah, there? yeah, we, we've set the camera and come back and then you check three or four days later and you have some pictures and that's what, and then we started mapping these, these locations and saying, okay, confirmed fishing cat, confirmed fishing cat, confirmed. And you know, we'd put all these locations and then we'd go in and find out and talk to the local people and like, hey, have you seen this cat? And they're like, yeah, we see this cat in and out, you know. And then why, why is this habitat not being protected? Because there's no incentive. Who cares? It's like cut the trees down and then use it and then build farms. By the way, the biggest threat to cats, these fishing cats and these uh, uh, locations, the habitat, is our seafood consumption. I learned Monterey Bay Aquarium became our part, or we were part, became our, their partners last year. And they, uh, I learned that over 90% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported. And that just blew my mind. And if you go to any grocery stores, you'll see product of India, product of Thailand, product of Vietnam, product of Sri Lanka. And it's all these fish and shrimp farms that have decimated mangrove forests. And we've lost like over 50% of the historic mangrove forest cover. No. And um, yeah, so, there you go. That's the business. I want to hear, uh, no, no, that's really important. I mean, I think that is super important because I think you're talking now about an ecosystem. You start with the cat, your love of the cat, you follow the cat, then you see the cat, then you learn that nobody cares about the cat and all of the other problems, which is really right. what you're trying. Well, to at, what, at what point does yeah. it become the, you see that the mangrove is fading away and that people are, you know, uh, you know, that it's a part of an ecosystem and that you need to save the cat as a, as a way to save the mangrove forests. Right, so um, we started out with the cat and then we found out that this problem is, gonna, is much larger than the cat itself. Um, and that the mangrove ecosystem, well, actually, first let me clarify that fishing cats also live in inland wetland ecosystems like rivers and swamps and lakes. Uh, but many of their populations are concentrated in these mangrove forests in South and Southeast Asia. So, you know, 11 range countries in South and Southeast Asia, all the way from Pakistan to Indonesia, or I should do this the opposite way. Um, so what we discovered was mangroves in general are these amazing ecosystems. They protect coastlines from tsunamis. They are the source of freshwater fish, shrimp and crab to local people in many cases, you know, in, you know, a large number of human populations depend on, you know, sustainable fisheries from these mangrove forests. Uh, so it's a primary source of food and livelihood. They also uh, are, this is what I call the icing on the earth fact or icing on the cake fact. Um, mangroves store upwards of five to 10 times more carbon dioxide than tropical forests. So protecting an acre of mangroves is like protecting five or more acres of tropical or upland forests. Think about that. I mean, this ecosystem has probably one of the best bangs for anyone's conservation buck. So, um, Ashwin, can I, I want to ask you a question. How is the overfishing? I just, just take me through and the audience through the thread, the overfishing, what, what's happening? And just explain that to the audience. Like what is happening with that overfishing that kind of screws up everything else, right? 
Right. Aquaculture is non-sustainable because, or unsustainable in many ways because you have, you've dug out a pond, you've dug out a farm on the land, right? And you're filling it with, uh, you know, concentrated you know, pollutants, chemicals, and shrimp, and you're trying to basically increase the productivity within an acre and or whatever unit area. And then after the produce is done, it's sold, and then all of that pollutant water has to be pumped out. And it's pumped out into the natural rivers. And so it, it, it reduces or impacts the fish stock, the, the, the natural fish stock in the rivers, right? And they have to keep doing this year over year over year. And after three or four years, the productivity of that unit acre drops off dramatically. Okay. And then they need to replenish the entire soil base. And they dig it up. They dig up the pond. They like it completely messes up the entire okay. unit. And, and then because and, uh, there's a lot of salt concentration, there's a lot of chemical and pollutant concentration. And so that basically, and farmers lose their livelihood. Aquaculture farmers are get attracted with the money, the awesome profits, the first few years, the short-term profits. And then long-term they are, their lives are complete. And these big companies, they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to extract this. I'm going to go extract this. I'm going to extract these farmers. And then finally, it, ultimately, now aquaculture is an industry that is so focused on improving efficiency and sustainability because they, they can't live without sustainability, right? And I'm going, well, here's a mangrove forest that is sustainably producing fish, shrimp, and crab. And you don't have to pump it with chemicals. You don't have to, uh, you know, provide do uh, basically uh, anything to it, and it will naturally produce, albeit it won't be as high of a productivity level. But guess what? We can create multiple sources of income with a mangrove forest. Not only would it provide for your food and, uh, you know, base livelihood, but we can make it a carbon sink and get you carbon offset money. We can establish a nature reserve and get people to come visit your nature reserve and get you a third source of income. So, and then we created that with FishCat, we created uh, Earth Camp, we created a nature reserve, we're experimenting with those ideas. Uh, but basically, um, you know, it's on the premise that there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but there's not enough in the world for everybody's greed, which I think is a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. So when you, um, the first um, farmer, the first fisherman, you know, they're not con conservationists. They're just trying to feed their families. And you've had success at turning some of them into conservationists because there's a different way of, of uh, them making a living. What were the first meetings like, like for that? That's a, that's a great question. Like we would go in, just like I said, you know, where we left off going and exploring these locations where these fishing cats are. And they'd ask like, hey, what are you here for? And we'd show them the photo of the fishing cat and say, hey, we're here to look for this cat. And can you tell us where this, you know, have you seen this cat? And, you know, just kind of get the conversation started. It's a, the cat is a conversation starter, believe it or not. It's the hook for this entire program. Right. And then begins the idea of, okay, how's your life doing? You know, is there a way that nature is providing for your livelihood? And how can we, so that, that's, that's, that's what happened. And then, we discovered that the problems are deep rooted. I mean, the local uh, fringe fishermen, the really the people who do sustainable fisheries, they're the ones throwing the net, catching their daily catch, and going mm -hmm. home. They they were complaining. They were like, you know, all these farmers, uh, for aquaculture farms, they've come in, they've destroyed our local fish, uh, you know, our uh, stock, mm -hmm. and basically we are suffering, and we want there to be. And so, what one case in one case, uh, this is our poster child story um we found one guy his name is moshi he used to be a poacher he used to hunt these animals and he used to sell them off to the local cir circus for a living and so we said hey you know you're a tribal uh from this area and you'd been dependent on these forests well he, he was telling us a story he's like well there's really no more livelihood based on forests anymore how we used to live um now it's all so commercialized and we got a do something to feed our family. He had a family of 30 people. I mean, this, this, this entire thing is a community. And so we said, okay, how can we help Moshi uh, into a more sustainable uh, way of living? And so we 
offered him a job to detect these cats. And believe it or not, we got some of the best fishing cat footage with his help. Mm. And we, we paid him for a year, year and a half. And then he, we connected him with the local forest authorities. And the forest department, they had a leopard rescue. They called on him. So he became this asset to- So the poacher uh, turned, it's like reconciliation. The huh? poacher turned conservationist. That's the poster child story for that us. That is amazing. And so he's, he's living right now. He just sent a video, believe it or not, uh, as we were speaking uh, of, uh, uh, you know, texting me his uh, 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 tractor that he is now uh, pushing mm. on, on the farm. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I should, I'll play it. Put it, but... it, to us. Put it, it in the chat. Yeah. The phone. Yeah, look at him running that tractor. Ah, nice. <laughs> Yeah. So basically, um, the, the point I want to make is if we can create jobs and that incentivize, and we're working with Vinkat and other aquaculture farmers right now who are now planting mangroves in their aquaculture farms and restoring that mangrove. So what we're telling Vinkat is, hey, we will, we will give you carbon offset funds or rather our incentive contracts that we provide to our land partners to grow a forest on their land. And uh, we will, we will, that will be your first source of income for the first few years. And as your forest grows and starts to produce, you can start to, uh, you know, draw in income from that. And then we'll establish a nature reserve near you and basically create uh, another source of livelihood for you. So we're trying to create multiple streams of income for these guys to the now point you, where you, you actually have done this successfully return some land to Mangroves, yeah. You you've had one well, area which was overproduced, and it was, you know, yeah. We partnered. We partnered with about um, seven hundred acres of landowners in India and Sri Lanka so far, um, and uh, it, actually, even in the U.S., we're trying to experiment with this. Um, but uh, the idea. I mean, we've we've only done. We've only really practiced restoration on about thirty to. 50 acres. And that, that's what's going on right now is about we're restoring, we're truly restoring about 30 to 50 acres. And we're experimenting with the plan that if we create a circular economy here of providing multiple nature based sources of income to uh, the, the landowner, that landowner will select for conservation and nature as an opportunity for a much more sustainable carbon negative livelihood than aquaculture or other unsustainable jobs. Um, and so that's, that's our plan pretty much is to create sustainable and more enriched livelihoods uh, that are based off of conservation. Is, is there a way for our viewers to get involved? Like could they sponsor a cat or something? I was gonna say, if you go to fishcat.org, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect every of our donors who we call investors, right? With the land partners uh, who we are partnering with. So if you scroll down that page, you'll find uh, some t-shirts that have QR codes. I don't know if one of you has your cell phone with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just go to that website and um, scan the QR code on the website. Yeah. I think Priscilla is doing this. I'm doing it. Do you see it? I'm screen sharing the cat. Can you see oh, it? Is that your, yeah, your, she's, 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 she, yeah, you can, you're screen oh, sharing the cat. Through some so, of the pictures of the cats. Look how beautiful that cat is. I mean, this is just one I wanted everyone to see this, but like, who we have so many. Picture? Yeah, that's a beautiful who picture. Took this one? Is this, is this that's taken your... by Anjani Kumar. He's a professional photographer. And again, you know, we were connect, we're connecting talent with uh, local people here. And this is the product of a local fisherman community in collaboration with a professional wildlife photographer. So and what's this cat's name, by the way? Does this cat have <laughs> you, can name, you can name the cat. Is it now, a boy or a girl? I gotta think about it. I'll come I back have no that. idea, we don't know if it's, but if you, if you were, when you were doing that screen share, can you go to fishcat.org? Oh, that's, this was so, you know, this took me 20 minutes to figure out how to do that. Okay. I've been having oh, a double thing happening. I've been multitasking, talking to you, trying to keep this going. And Eric, can you put on fishcat.org? Um, uh, yeah, somebody yeah. on our team can. Sure, I'll get it. Um, but, um, uh, now, Claire's doing it. Now, have you ever seen one in the wild? Yeah, it took about four years 
uh, of research of just tracks and poop. Yeah. But after that, finally, we saw one because we had to see one. Uh, and, and that was my dream is that one day, you know, we'll be able to ride on a fisherman's boat and get actually get to see the cat. Um, and were you it, surprised when it showed up? Not really, because we knew we were they were there and we documented them. And we just, you know, we go on a fisherman's boat and fishermen see them all the time. And mm. so even now, as part of our earth camps, we are restoring these lands. They become nature reserves and habitats for these cats. And you can actually go get to see them so uh, you, you yeah, study in the uh, wild. You study tigers. You know, how's this cat different from a tiger? Um, well, not so different in terms of endangerment because they are pretty endangered, uh, but different in that uh, they're, you know, much smaller, uh, very less known. I wish we could make fishing cats as cool and well-known or even in fact more well-known than tigers. Well, maybe we're uh, on the way to doing that. Let's yeah, just, and, first of all, we're going to name this cat for you. That's number one. Now, I don't right. know if we're name it really, but, but. Uh, well, there's a lot of cat lovers, even, you know, on our team here. So. Um, so, you know what is kind of amazing though, Ashwin? I'm just thinking something. You know, you started out, you were an engineer, then you fell in love with the cats, but you know, you are engineering a whole system. You are an engineer because you, you <laughs> started with one thing, right? You cared about, but then you saw all of these other things. I just want to let you know and could let your dad know, like, you are an engineer. Yeah, well, he's an engineer too. And, you I know, he, yeah, yeah, he's an industrial engineer and he, well, so he are loves. You. He loves mentoring me and, you know, he, his number one quote these days, well, by the way, he visited me and he was impressed with, uh, he went to, St uh, he went to visit Sanford uh, to the design thinking uh, school IDEO. And he was, he's so about design thinking these days. And he's like, the number one step in design thinking is empathy. If you do not empathize with your uh, stakeholder, your customer, your investor, everybody, yeah. You're not getting insight, the needed insight that is. Oh my gosh, we have to talk. We have <laughs> yeah. to bring you back because yeah, this is our whole company is based on this. This is what right. all we think about. It's all it, yeah, so I, I was going to say on the empathy note that every investor of, of Fishcat gets to be linked with the location on the planet that we are restoring. So in, in what we're trying to do is if you scan that code, it'll take you to the location that we are restoring. And so we are trying to provide every investor with a carbon offset. And in fact, a gift that keep, you, you by investing in Fishcat, you're creating a forest that lives in your legacy forever. Mm. So I don't understand uh, this, but I'm actually looking into the world of why philanthropy is at the mercy of capitalism these days in the world. And why can't we just, I mean, if I were to die tomorrow, I want to leave this world a better place, right? And I want my money. And that's one of our top investors too. He's like, he's written off 30% of his legacy into fish cat because what, what he wants to see is basically, uh, you know, a, a, a better world. And what we're trying to do really is earth restoration for the humanity of the future, uh, the future of humanity, right? Even if we need to explore other planets, we're going to have to restore earth's resources and sustain them mm -hmm. and so that that's our legacy model is is we want to be able to create these long-term relationships between landowner and investor and donor and basically make that a re lifelong relationship that you know remains on the land forever well Ashwin, this, oh my gosh. This yeah is ho hopefully we can be a little part of um helping some people become aware of what you're doing and you know we're big fans of what you're doing and we want to stay involved so you know, come back on, you know, and, yeah. and you know, yeah, later you on. Come back another, you know. Yeah, bring your dad next time. Yeah, that, for that sure. Him. He would love, he would love to let's get on. That. Yeah, let's get do on that. a podcast. Um, it's so yeah. great. He, uh, you know, I love Tucson. I have family there. So, yeah, I enjoy the, you know, it's probably beautiful weather there, hopefully right now. And um, we, we want to see you again. So, yeah. sure. So yeah, much. I would love to. Thank you guys so much for this awesome wondrous yeah. podcast ah, ah, there you go. thank you, you